I got to address the Daily Show. This is my first time. I, you know, I was out in Orlando for the Money Show, so I missed uh, the opportunity to immediately respond to uh, the Daily Show. And you know, I did on my Facebook page and on Shift Radio. I put out uh, some written responses. Uh, to the Daily Show hatchet job, but I never really had a a chance to personally address it, uh, you know, in in this format. So I'm going to basically spend a good part of today's show really dissecting the the Daily Show interview and really exposing uh, it for what it is. Because, you know, what is amazing to me, more so than what the Daily Show did, and of course, you know, people are going to say, Peter, what did you expect? I mean, it was an obvious trap. You know, sometimes you walk into an obvious trap on the chance that maybe it isn't a trap. Uh, You know, they lied to me in writing and even during the interview. They said, don't worry, Peter, we're not going to try to make you look bad. You know, we're going to give you a fair airing. We want to get your opinion. We're not going to take anything out of context. Uh, You know, so in other words, they lied through their teeth over and over again. Now, you know, they're trying to make me look bad because I oppose uh, the minimum wage. So they think that's a horrible thing, but they have no problem with lying. Lying is perfectly okay. And I guess, you know, liberals believe in theft. They think that's okay. So why should they think there's anything wrong with lying if you have to lie to get what you want? So they did that. And yeah, they fooled me, right? Uh, Although I was suspicious, but I didn't think they would make it this bad. They actually exceeded uh, my expectations on how low they would actually sink uh, to outrage their audience, to maybe get a laugh. I didn't even think it was that funny and to advance uh, their political agenda. But, you know, what's even more troubling than The uh, Daily Show is the reaction. I mean, first of all, the audience for The Daily Show. I mean, you know, they actually think the stuff is real. They think this is a legitimate interview. They don't think it's a comedy skit. They think that the words they're hearing are the words that I spoke. I mean, yes, I spoke those words, but not in that context, not in that order, right? What they do is they interview me for four hours. And believe me, I I tried to leave several times, and I should have just walked out the door. But they really wanted to keep me there, and they kept asking me these questions. And I was like, well, don't you have enough yet? I mean, why why are we still having this discussion? Obviously, they needed a lot of material to try to piece it together in the way that they wanted. But what ends up happening is they take unrelated uh, statements that I make and put them together. They juxtapose things in a certain way to create a certain impression. I mean... They'll, you'll see Samantha B asking a question, and then you'll see my answer. But my answer they're showing isn't to that question. It's to a different question. In some cases, my answer is from two or three different questions, and they take little bits of the answer and they smush them together to make an answer that I didn't actually give, but one that fits with their agenda, which is to make me look as bad as they possibly can. So people are, are outraged by what I've said, but that's not what I said. I said something differently. You know, it came out differently from my mouth, but that's not how they showed it. Now, even some conservatives are buying this. If you go to some of the conservative websites, and by the way, there's much, you know, very few conservative websites are even talking about this. It's almost all uh, the liberal websites that are all over it. It would be nice if some conservative websites really wanted to take this issue up and come out, you know, defending me. But even on a few of these conservative sites, they say, well, you know, Peter, of course, is right about the the minimum wage, but he could have expressed himself better. I did express myself better. I expressed myself a lot better. That's the point. They didn't allow that expression on their on their segment. They edited me so that my expressions would come out in such a way that would offend and outrage as many people as they could. So, it, you know, there, there, there was no way for me to express myself good in that segment. In fact, I think I did such a good job in the interview that that's why they felt it was so important to distort it the way they did, because, you know, I really did a good job of exposing the inherent flaws in, in, in the minimum wage. But even more so than, than, than just the audience, what about the reporters? Go on the Internet and look at all of the newspapers, online papers and websites that reported what I said on The Daily Show as if I actually said it, which I did it. The Daily Show said that stuff. But they took it as if it was a news segment and they wrote about all the things that I said and they put quotations around all these fabricated sentences that I never actually spoke. And the thing is, not a single reporter 
before they wrote about this, bothered to contact me to verify those quotes. Hey, you know, we watched The Daily Show. Did you actually say this stuff? You know, before we write about what you said, we want to confirm that you, in fact, did say it, and it wasn't just something created, you know, in the editing process. No, no, no. They just accepted everything on blind faith that The Daily Show was fair and balanced, that they represented exactly what I said in the manner that I said it in, in, in its full context. And then they wrote about it and they started to, you know, tear me down and talk about what a bad person I was. But look, we got a quick break. I'm going to go back. We're going to go to those clips. I'm going to dissect it segment by segment. We're going to go over what The Daily Show showed you, right, what it showed its viewers. And then I'll tell you what actually happened. I'll give you the proper context of each statement that they used so you can see what I actually said and what was meant and what The Daily Show wanted to pretend that I was saying. I'm going to start. I'm going to go over piece by piece the portions of this segment that featured me. Right? And I think the total on camera time is about 70 or 75 seconds. So that's a little over a minute. Remember, I spoke for almost four hours, four hours. Now, we've requested that The Daily Show make the raw footage, all that unedited footage available, because I want to put it up on the Internet on my YouTube channel. I want people to actually see the interview that took place, the questions I was asked, and the actual answers that I gave in the context that they were made. Uh, I think people might be shocked at, at what they hear, particularly coming from uh, Samantha B who is, you know, clearly a socialist. And anybody who listens to the real interview, if you don't understand that she's a socialist or a Marxist, you know, but it, it'd be obvious. I can see why she would be embarrassed to actually have the discussion that she had, because we did argue back and forth. And uh, I, I don't blame her for not wanting the public to actually see uh, what a horrible job she did when she actually had to try to defend her position, which, in fact, are undefensible. Uh, if you have a real intelligent debate about the minimum wage, it's clear that it needs to be eliminated. Uh, but, you know, they didn't want that to come out in this interview. That's why they just wanted to attack me as a person to say, oh, see, here's the example of somebody who doesn't like the minimum wage, somebody who wants to enslave the intellectually disabled and force them to work for $2 an hour uh, because you're worth what you're worth. But I'm going to get into that later. But let's start off uh, with the setup. Here is uh, the way they introduced the, the segment here. It's a cut number five. There's a philosophical discussion underway in America about the minimum wage. Some people, like financial commentator Peter Schiff, think increasing it could have devastating effects. Yeah, okay, so there's nothing wrong with the introduction except that it's deceptive because based on the introduction, you think that, okay, we're going to see this philosophical discussion. But you don't, right? None of the philosophy that I expressed, that I discussed, is going to come out in the piece. So they set it up as if it's a real journalistic piece, not a hit job on me, in which all of my words are taken out of context to make me look like a uncaring, uh, insensitive, uh, rich bigot, right? That's, you know, how I'm portrayed. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, move along here and get through this part. The next one is cut number six. There's uh, a, a law in economics, supply and demand. It's something that you learn in Econ 101. And as you increase the price of something, you decrease the demand. And wages, you know, that's the price of labor. The higher you make the minimum wage, the more jobs are going to be destroyed. Okay, so now that's fine. It, that's not taken out of context. That's the beginning of my explanation. Of course, I, there was a lot that followed that point that does not, uh, is not shown there. But then, of course, uh, you know, they try to make fun of me uh, because of my discussion of supply and demand. And they try to put up a graph, or they do put up a graph of supply and demand. The problem is they mixed up the graph. You see, the demand curve uh, slopes down. They had it sloping up. The supply curve slopes up. They had it sloping down. So they mixed up supply and demand. They got it backwards. So they're trying to make fun of me for not understanding economics, yet they don't understand supply and demand. Right? So they got, it, they got it exactly backwards as if, you know, obviously the more expensive something is, demand doesn't rise with price. It falls with price. Supply rises with price. But, so they got it wrong. But some people pointed this out after the show aired. And so they went back in time and they, they fixed it. So now, if you go and watch the clip, the supply and demand charts are accurate. But they were inaccurate when they did it. So they also know that you know, there's a lot of false impressions that they're, 
that their clip created about me, but they're not going to go back and edit my stuff, you know, to reflect what I actually said. But they did get supply and demand wrong. But when they realized that, they went back and changed it. So now that if you go there, you don't really know that they mixed it up because they know nothing about economics, which is clear, right? But uh, so I'm pointing it out that they, that they did make a mistake and then they went back and fixed it. But now here's where they really start to veer off and start taking stuff out of context. So let's play this next clip. It is cut number seven. I mean, you care about the poor. Of course I do. Yeah. I, I just acknowledge that government programs are trapping them in poverty. Yeah, now that's part of the discussion about my caring about the poor. But now they want to start talking about poor people and asking me, you know, do I care about the poor? Um, you know, it, because they're trying to set up the next portion of the segment. Because, you know, as if, you know, uh, she asked me if I cared about the poor right after I, I mentioned the supply and demand curves. I mean, there was a lot that took place between the introduction of that principle and a, a later discussion about poor people and where poverty comes from, and that the minimum wage is, in fact, causing poverty because it's denying people the opportunity to get jobs that might enable them to lift themselves out of poverty. Instead, they're, they're rendered unemployable, and so they never get the training that they would need uh, to be able to earn more money and, and, and to get out of poverty. That's kind of like a side discussion, but she, she threw that in there uh, as if this is how things progressed. So now here's this next clip. This is an interesting one. Cut number eight. Why have one job for $15 an hour? I have two jobs for $7.50 an hour. Now, you see, that statement there, it looks as if that has to do with our discussion of the poor. <clears throat> but it doesn't. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. That was taken completely out of context from an entirely different discussion that we had. And I'll, I'll let you know what we talked about. I told Samantha B. I explained to her the origin of the minimum wage. I told her that the very first minimum wages were supported by trade unions because they represent skilled workers and they were trying to eliminate competition from lower skilled workers. And I gave her an example. I said, suppose a skilled worker can do a job for $15 an hour. That's what they're charging for their labor. But suppose an employer can hire two unskilled workers for $7 an hour, right? Well, Seven times two is 14. So if I can hire two unskilled workers and pay them $7 an hour, if they can do the same thing as one skilled worker who requires 15, well, I'm not gonna pay the skilled worker 15 because I can hire the unskilled workers instead. And I explained to her that what the labor unions did is they would require a minimum wage. Let's say the labor unions could successfully lobby for an $8 minimum wage. Well, now if I hire two unskilled workers and pay them $8 each, that's 16. Well, that's more expensive than the skilled worker who I could pay 15. So in that case, the minimum wage makes the unskilled laborers unemployed. I can't hire them. And so I pay the skilled worker 15 rather than paying two unskilled workers eight. So that's where this whole discussion of paying people seven fifty an hour versus 15. She was trying to understand the point that I was trying to make which was that the original intent of the minimum wage was to make it difficult for unskilled people to get jobs. It was designed to help highly paid skilled workers uh, avoid competition uh, from younger, less skilled workers. And of course, the minimum wage is having that precise effect today. The people who are most hurt by the minimum wage are the very people that the liberals purport to want to help with the minimum wage. Now, let's get back to uh, this carefully constructed comedy skit uh, that they put together uh, by slicing and dicing all of my comments and putting them out of order and juxtaposing them where they didn't belong and trying to create you know, a false impression. But let's go back to uh, what they did. So th remember, we just played the cut where uh, Samantha B talked about people making two people making 750 instead of one person making 15, right? Now, here is the response that they have me making immediately following that statement right here. Cut number nine. What would you what would you rather do that or pay twice as much for your burger? I do like to taste the tears of poverty in my milkshakes. Now, the implication is I said that, you know, would you rather have that or pay twice as much immediately after she talked about the $15 an hour versus $750? Uh-uh. 
that particular statement had nothing to do with that discussion because that discussion wasn't about McDonald's where we talked about that. That discussion was about um, the origins of the minimum wage. The discussion about where I said, would you rather pay twice as much for your burger? That took place at a very separate part of the interview when we talked about the minimum wage and a fair wage or a wage that would enable somebody to support a family. I said that McDonald's provides entry level jobs, right? These are not jobs that are designed to support a family. She was under the impression that all jobs, no matter what the skill level, that every job created should enable the worker to support a family. And I said, well, that's that's crazy. That's ridiculous. That could never happen. I said, theoretically, I suppose McDonald's could pay all of its workers, the fry cooks and the cashiers, enough to support a family. But then, you know, you'd have to pay twice as much for your burgers. So which would you prefer? So they took that little statement about paying twice as much for your burgers and they grabbed it. They pulled it out of there and they stuck it right after her answer. So they they put it in its its wrong context. You know, we didn't just talk about McDonald's. We talked a lot about Walmart, right, the big villain. They didn't show any of that. But I, I explained to Samantha that Walmart and McDonald's were providing the entry-level jobs that a lot of other businesses don't. I mean, I, I tried to explain to her. I asked her questions. I said, Samantha, where do you think young kids without skills are going to get jobs? I mean, isn't it good good that there are entry level jobs? Would you prefer that McDonald's not provide entry level jobs or that uh, Walmart not provide entry level jobs? I mean, what are all these kids going to do? I explained, you know, you've got black teenage unemployment, 40, 50 percent. How are they going to get jobs if the only jobs they can get are ones where you need enough skills where you can uh, support a family? I mean, I explained about all the minimum wage jobs I had growing up. You know, where I delivered groceries, bagged groceries, delivered pizza, worked in a shoe store, you know, sold cable TV subscriptions door to door, different things that I did. But I said, you know, if my employers were forced to pay me enough money to support a family, I wouldn't have had any of those jobs. But of course, why do they need to pay me enough to support a family when I'm still living with my parents? I don't have to support a family. I just need gas money, money to go to the movies or money to take a girl out on a date. I don't need to support anybody. I was working more for the experience. I, I told her, what's better if young inner city kids get a low paying job or they have no job and they're out in a street gang? You know, I explained all this stuff about, you know, look, you know, is it better for someone to have a job at $5 an hour and actually learn something or to be unemployed at $7.25 an hour and learn nothing? And be, and be trapped in poverty. You know, my grandfather started out as a carpenter's apprentice in Europe before he came to the United States. He worked for this guy for years for free. And not only did he work for him for free, he did personal errands for the guy. He was like, you know, you know, he, like a houseboy. He lived at his house. I guess he got room and board, but he helped him. But during those years, and he was young, he was 14, 15, 16, he wasn't going to high school. He was working for a carpenter as an apprentice, learning how to be a carpenter. Now, he didn't try to raise a family on an apprentice's salary, which, you know, was zero. No. But eventually, after my grandfather, you know, emigrated to the United States, because of what he learned as an apprentice, he became a highly skilled carpenter and he earned enough money to support my grandmother and eight children, eight children. He eventually even employed several people on his own. He started a small little carpentry business. I mean, it never became anything big, but he hired some people. Well, what if the initial carpenter where my grandfather apprenticed, what if there was a minimum wage and he was required to pay my grandfather the minimum wage? He never would have hired him. He couldn't have afforded to pay him and train him. So my grandfather never would have acquired those skills. So maybe he would have been trapped in poverty his entire life. But because there was no minimum wage, he had opportunity to learn and, and develop skills. Of course, young people in America are being denied these opportunities right now, which is why most of the skilled trade laborers that we have in America didn't even grow up in America. They came here from other countries where they were able to learn their skills, and then they came to America to apply their skills. Meanwhile, we have all these young people who can't acquire those skills because we won't let them get jobs uh, where they can be trained. So that's where that discussion came from. And now her little comment about, well, I like the taste of tears 
in poverty in my milkshakes. And I remember that statement, and I really let her have her, let her, let her have it for making that statement uh, about you know the tears of poverty. Because you know, it's if you want tears of poverty, poverty deny people the opportunity to get their first job, right? Don't let them step on the first rung of the economic ladder. And of course, I described to her that you know it's not uh, poverty. Right. The people, you know, that, that McDonald's or Walmart aren't creating poverty by creating entry level jobs. You know, somebody's got to create them. Right. Thank God that there are entry level jobs. I mean, I told her that, you know, I don't employ anybody at the minimum wage at my companies because by the time I employ them, they have more skills. But some of the people maybe that I employ maybe got their start at McDonald's or Walmart. I don't you know. I don't know where they worked when they were young. But, you know, you got to start someplace. You can't start at the top. But apparently, you know, uh, The Daily Show doesn't realize that. So let's uh, let's continue. The next cut um, is cut number 10. I found it so hard to explain those kinds of complex economic theories to those desperate people. <clears throat> well, of course, she couldn't explain those economic theories because she doesn't understand them herself. How is she going to explain them? And they're actually not complex. I mean, maybe to somebody of Samantha B's limited intellectual capacity, uh, they seem complicated, but they're not. They're actually quite simple. If she simply paid attention to what I was saying, instead of just clinging steadfast to her socialist ideology, maybe she would have understood those principles. Now, of course, I don't necessarily expect a lot of the people who are working at McDonald's to necessarily understand those principles either, not because I'm insulting their intelligence, but they haven't been exposed uh, to, you know, what I'm saying. Um, Samantha B had four hours of explanation, so she's got no excuse for not understanding it. The people that she's interviewing, you know, didn't have the benefit of sitting down in a room with Peter Schiff for four hours. I mean, I would I would throw a challenge out there to anybody who, uh, you know, believes in the minimum wage a big support of the minimum wage, to sit down with me for four hours, one-on-one, -on -one, and at the end of that discussion, not be convinced that the minimum wage is a bad idea and doing a lot of harm. But, you know, Samantha B. did not have an open mind. She had an agenda. So here is uh, the next cut, cut number 11. I mean, you ever go into McDonald's or Burger King? I mean, I don't really eat there, but... They don't seem desperate and hungry to me. They're young kids. They seem to be enjoying themselves mostly. Those irrepressible teens with their teen hijinks. Okay, so we had a discussion where she's talking about how McDonald's is exploiting all their workers. And I explained to her that McDonald's isn't exploiting anybody. I said, first of all, you know, they don't they don't force anybody to work there. They don't hold a gun to people's heads. In fact, I used the example, you know, in Walmart because she said they were exploiting people. I said, look, you know, when they open up a new store, they get 50 applicants for every one job. I said, if they were exploiting people, they wouldn't get any applicants. I mean, people aren't, you know, lining up to be exploited. I said, by, you know, by, you know, definition, if somebody accepts a job at either McDonald's or Burger King, Right. They do so because that's the best job they can find. So I said, how are you exploiting somebody by giving them a better deal than anybody else was willing to offer? I mean, people who are working at McDonald's or Walmart, if they could get a better job for more money, they would quit and take it. See, exploitation would be if they were chained to their, you know, to their cash registers and Walmart didn't allow them to take all the better jobs or, more, you know, that they were being offered, right? They were stuck there by force. They were held there by gunpoint. But no, they're free to quit any day they want and take any skills that they acquired uh, at McDonald's or Walmart and, and sell them to another employer uh, who might be willing to pay more. But the fact that people are still at these jobs and that they are applying for these jobs must mean uh, that they're not being exploited. And, you know, I think that, you know, you, I find it offensive that you have a lot of people that don't hire anybody. And I made this point to Samantha B, who, you know, I said, well, are you going to go offer these McDonald's workers a better job? Why don't you offer them something then better than what they're getting? But all these people that don't employ anybody are criticizing other companies that do employ people and who actually are giving people the opportunity to earn some money and to advance their skills so that they can eventually earn more money, right? But I also said that there are a lot of teenagers and young adults, people in their 20s, that are working in the fast food industry, not Miss McDonald's. And when I've gone to some of these fast food places, uh, you know, 
people don't look like they're miserable. I mean, they're generally smiling. Maybe they're talking to their friends. It's something to do after school. You know, they're not in misery. They're not, no, you know, there's not, now there are some people, you know, that, you know, would prefer not to be there, but it's the only job they can get, obviously. But, you know, this is not exploitation. They're not, you know, working in, uh, you know, whatever kind of slave labor camps or something like that. But this next clip is where, you know, Samantha B brings up, you know, a hypothetical situation or, you know, a situation that maybe not necessarily would always be hypothetical. And she says, well, what about this? Right. Let me let me play it here. It's it's cut number 12. What would you tell a 48 year old man with a bachelor's degree who works full time in fast food that he is not entitled to a living wage? You're, you're, you're creating a hypothetical situation that's not going to exist. I'm 48 so, years. You're 48 and you're still in high school? I have a bachelor's degree. I end up working there because I was out a job and couldn't find a job at the time due to the economy. Give me a picture. Okay, so she says, what about someone who's 48? And has a college degree and, you know, aren't they entitled to a living wage? Well, not if they're going to work cooking French fries at McDonald's. I mean, if somebody is 48, um, you know, they can't demand that McDonald's pay them uh, the type of salary that, you know, somebody with a college degree, someone who's 48 years old is expected to get. I mean, even if I was an unemployed engineer, and I decided to accept the job at McDonald's cooking French fries. I can't demand to be paid as if I was still doing engineering. I mean, I'm not engineering those French fries. I'm frying them up. If I want to do those kind of a, that kind of a job, that's all I'm going to get paid, right? You know, I mean, look, you know, if an NFL quarterback decides that he wants to leave the NFL where he's making $20 million a year and cook French fries at McDonald's, can he demand to be paid as if he was still throwing touchdowns? Look, if that's the job that you're going to perform, there's only a certain amount of wage you can be paid for doing that kind of job. I mean, McDonald's, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be a fry cook, you can be a high school dropout or a physicist. If you're cooking French fries, there's not much difference, right? And I said, is that McDonald's fault? Now, I did explain because she told me, well, what if there's somebody that is 48 years old because she said we talked to somebody who was 48 years old and who had a college degree and i said well first of all why don't you blame the college you know i mean maybe the guy i mean maybe he didn't learn anything maybe he majored in something ridiculous and learned absolutely nothing right just because he has a college degree doesn't mean he knows anything but i said how is that mcdonald's fault if somebody with a lot of skills is applying for an entry-level job with no skills i mean what are they supposed to do about it it's not their fault. Those are not the types of jobs that they are creating. They are creating jobs, jobs that are designed for low-skilled people entering the job market for the first time. They are not creating jobs for 48-year-olds unless you're talking about store manager. And, of course, you know, a lot of the store managers started out uh, at minimum wage jobs, and they worked their way up, right? That, that's how the process works. But you can't force McDonald's to pay high wages for entry-level workers. That's all part of that discussion where, you know, unless you want to double the price of the burgers, you know, and there'd be a lot more because the people aren't going to pay double the price. So you're going to destroy uh, your business if you try to you try to do that. So I explain, look, you can always come up with these rare, you know, exceptions, not the rule scenarios. But raising the minimum wage isn't going to do anything. Now, I suppose, right, if McDonald's were forced to pay $15 an hour or $20 an hour, then if they had the choice between a 16-year-old, you know, kid, right, or a guy with a PhD, they would probably take the guy with a PhD if they cost exactly the same amount. I mean, I would do that, right? I mean, if I was running a McDonald's and I had all these really smart people uh, with advanced degrees that used to earn lots of money, if they all want to cook French fries, I might hire them. I might figure, well, it's the same amount of money. So who gets hurt in that scenario? The young guy who's trying to enter the job market, uh, you know, he he can't get a job because now, you know, other people are taking those entry-level jobs. Now, I tried to bring up the point to Samantha B. Why is the economy so bad that a 48-year-old guy trying to support a family would have to resort to a job at, at, at McDonald's. And I said, thank God McDonald's is there, otherwise you would have no job, right? But I said, why don't we look at the other economic policies 
that you support that are being pursued by President Obama and Congress that are destroying the economy and destroying those better paying jobs. Now, I said, of course, you know, that's the subject for a different discussion. We're here to talk about the minimum wage and its adverse effects on the economy, right? And in particular on, you know, young people, inner city kids, uh, kids, you know, from minority backgrounds, right? I wanted to really talk about the problem for of the minimum wage, but that was a separate issue. Right. And who knows if it took four hours to discuss the minimum wage, I wonder how many hours it would have taken to discuss that particular topic. But what did they do? They just opposed me saying, well, that's a hypothetical situation. They immediately cut to this guy who claims he has a, a bachelor's degree. I mean, I'm not sure where he got it. He's not that, you know, I don't know. He doesn't speak very well. Maybe he didn't even get it in the States. I don't know. But, you know, and he's claiming that he's 48 and he's trying to support his kids and he's working at McDonald's. So this is supposed to prove me wrong. Now, I said, you know, she's coming up with hypothetical uh, situations which are going to be in the extreme. Now, maybe it makes me look out of touch to believe that it's impossible because I told her in that interview, right, that yes, right, it is possible for a 40-year-old year old guy to have a job, right, that it's the exception, not the rule, but you can't make policies for the exceptions. You can't say because occasionally people who are fall on hard times and who might temporarily have to fall back on a job beneath their skill level, that because of that, we need to force a higher minimum wage that's going to destroy the jobs of, for the vast majority of people who are working in the fast food industry, who are just trying to get their first job, who are trying to get some job experience, who are looking for something to do after school, right? who are looking for something on their resume. Right? So that was a big part of the discussion. All of that is left out. You know, the, the Daily Show wants to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be a comedy show, but then they want to pretend that they're an actual news show. Right. And they they hide behind their lies by saying, well, you know, it's a comedy show, so we can do what we want. But then they really want to uh, represent themselves as, as if they're a legitimate part of the political discourse. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of people who watch The Daily Show at 11 p.m., they watch it instead of watching the nightly news. They get their news from The Daily Show. And, of course, it is more entertaining than just watching, you know, ABC or Fox News or whatever. There are more laughs there. But people actually think that they're intermingling news with comedy, but they're not. There is no real news there, right? They are trying to advance a political agenda, so they have license to do things that a real a news organization wouldn't do. And the hypocrisy, they spend a lot of time criticizing, let's say, Fox News, because they say, well, you're not fair and balanced. Well, what are they? I mean, it's night and day. What could be more unfair and unbalanced than what they did to me? And, of course, I'm not the only person, right? I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only person that they've done this to. I mean, not, they didn't make an exception for me. I'm sure everybody who was interviewed for these segments by Samantha B had the same experience that I did, right? Uh, so, you know, it, it is utter hypocrisy for them to criticize other news organizations for doing things that are just are, are nothing compared to what they've done. And I think the best example of this is this next clip. Because this is where, you know, really, this is where this was the source of all the press. Most of what was said that we went over before was ignored. It's the following discussion that made all the headlines that got me, you know, in the, all over the blogosphere, all the hate mail, all the death threats, all the people who wished I would die. You know, and that's how liberals argue with you. If they don't like what they say, they want you to die in a very painful way. Right. Because you're a horrible person. Now, some people just wanted me to kill myself because they, you know, they didn't think that anybody else should bother. But this is the level to which they sink. It's all ad hominem. But let's get started. Before we get to that final clip where they you know, really try to make me look bad, we need to get to the setup. Because this is very important. Because this is where they deliberately set out to create this false impression by taking these two particular quotes unrelated, of course, and mashing them together and then inserting them where they don't belong to create the false impression, right, that the reason that I want to eliminate the minimum wage law is so the mentally or the intellectually disabled can work for $2 an hour, that somehow the minimum wage is preventing them from working for $2 an hour and I want to eliminate it so that they can work 
for $2 an hour. First, have a listen to the clip. So let's play it right now. But for many, when it comes to our economy, it's our country's founding principles that matter. If we eliminate the minimum wage law, then individuals would be free to accept jobs at whatever pay they're able to get. Now, you know, first of all, they start off with, you know, my talking about America's founding principles as if what I believe the founding principles are all about is paying the intellectually disabled $2 an hour. Of course, my discussion of America's founding principles had nothing to do with that. Of course, they also wanted to juxtapose that to the statement that they're about to play regarding not all men are created equal because they want to show that I'm some kind of a hypocrite because first I say I believe in America's founding principles and then I immediately say not all men are created equal because we know that all men being created equal are part of our founding principles. But of course, that has to do with equality under the law, not the equality in ability. And I had already made that clear uh, to Samantha B, but she didn't want to make it clear to the viewers of The Daily Show, the last thing she wanted to do was make it clear. But then they used my quote where I said that the reason I want to repeal the minimum wage is so that people can accept whatever job they can get. And when I made that statement, it had nothing to do at the time with the intellectually disabled. It was far earlier in the discussion. It was uh, you know towards the beginning of the four hours where I talked about how the minimum wage law actually made it illegal for people to work. And of course, if you ask most people, would you be in favor of a law that makes it illegal for some people to work? Most people would say, no, I would be opposed to such a law. But of course, that is exactly what the minimum wage does. So I explained to Samantha B, you know, I've used the example of $5 an hour, which is the only number I ever came up with. But I said, look, suppose there's a young kid who is offered a job at $5 an hour. And, you know, he thinks it's great. He really wants the job. He thinks he's going to learn a lot. It's something he wants to do. I said, why should that be illegal? If the employer is not able to pay $750, but is willing to pay $5, and if the kid is willing to accept that job, why should the government say, no, you can't do it. That's illegal, right? I said that people should be allowed to accept whatever job uh, they can get. If they think it's the right thing for them, if they think that the pay is worth the labor, if they think the experience uh, is going to help them, then why should the government come in and interject their opinion and say that, you know, you can't work? But they used that statement as the setup for what we're about to play, where they talked about, or where I talk about uh, people earning $2 an hour, where she asked me about that, because what they want to do is create the false impression that the reason that I want to uh, get rid of the minimum wage is to enable the intellectually disabled uh, to be paid $2 an hour. When at the time they edited this segment, they already knew that that was not what I wanted because the intellectually disabled were already exempt from the minimum wage. So it didn't matter even if they raised the minimum wage to $10 an hour or $12 an hour, it would not affect the intellectually disabled, because they are already exempt. It would affect other people, such as the the unpaid interns. It would enable them, if if we got rid of the minimum wage, it would allow unpaid unpaid interns to actually get paid instead of having to work for free, right? That would be a benefit. But no, they wanted to create the false impression that that is the real reason that I want to get rid of the minimum wage law is to enable uh, the intellectually disabled to be exploited, and, and earn $2 an hour. So that was really what created the impetus for all this negative headlines uh, because of that false impression that this was what I wanted to do. And of course, they chose to end the segment on, on that high note or, or low note, you know, from my perspective, because that is the final impression that they wanted to leave with their, their audience, that I'm a hypocrite, I'm a bad guy. I want to exploit the intellectually disabled. And of course, I don't even use the proper word because I'm such a bigot. I'm, you know, I, I chose to offend them by, uh, by using an offensive word that, of course, they, they could have edited out. But that particular statement where I say I want to get rid of the minimum wage so everybody can work for whatever job they can get, that enabled them to edit it and now put the following cut in, which I'm about to play, where Samantha B. now 
inserts a statement to create the impression that the statement she's about to make or the question she's about to pose immediately followed my statement about why I want to get rid of the minimum wage, which, of course, it did not. All of this was rearranged out of context to create that effect. But let's play this uh, this final clip where they where they really, really bring it home and they really, really set me up here. Uh, let's go ahead and play that one right now. All right, you know, we'll, we'll, a person whose work would be worth two dollars an hour. You know? All right. So that's the setup. Right. She says to me, paint me a picture of somebody who would be worth two dollars an hour. Now, where did that come from? Because I never brought up people working for two dollars an hour. She said, hey, could you paint me a picture of somebody that would be working for $2 an hour, right? Now, how did it come up, right? Well, I talked about the fact that if we didn't have a minimum wage, right, then uh, people whose skills were not worth the minimum wage, which is now seven twenty-five dollars an hour. But I also explained that you don't have to just be worth seven twenty-five dollars an hour. And of course, when I'm talking about worth, I'm not talking about your worth as a human being, your value, right? I'm talking about what you are worth to your employer, you know, your, the productivity of your labor, the impact that you make on that employer's profit and loss, right? I explained this to Samantha B that that is what I am referring to. And I said that it's not just the, 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 the seven twenty five an hour that your labor has to cover because employers have to deal with payroll taxes, uh, un unemployment, uh, workman's comp, that there's lots of other costs that factor in, not just the wages, the total employment costs. So if I hire somebody, the value of their labor has to compensate not only for their pay, but all the added costs that hiring them uh, will, will, will bring about, right? And I said that, so as a result, there are a lot of people, and I think I used the example of $5 an hour. I said there are a lot of people who might be able to get a job and earn $5 an hour, but they're unemployed, right? And I said to her, is it better to be employed at $5 an hour and maybe learn the skills that would enable you to earn a lot more than that in the future or to be unemployed at seven twenty five an hour. Right? So that's part of the discussion. But then she said, well, is, would it be OK if an employer paid just two dollars an hour? Right. And, and I said to her, well, you know, I don't think employers would be able to find a lot of workers at two dollars an hour. I said there's something called competition. I said if an employer wants to pay somebody $2 an hour, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to find somebody competent enough to do the job at $2 an hour. I said that employers compete for workers just the way customers, uh, they compete for customers. But when they compete for customers, it's based on low prices and customers shop around. They want to get the lowest price. Well, employers, when they shop around for workers, they want to get the lowest price. Of course, workers, they're trying to offer, they're trying to sell their wage, their labor at the highest price. But I also said that like customers, you know, workers also want quality, right? Customers don't just necessarily buy the cheapest product. They also want to take into account quality of the product, right? And so employers are looking at the same thing. They also want quality. It's not just that they want inexpensive labor or they want to pay low price. They want workers that can do good work. So there's a combination there and there's competition. So I said, if you want to hire somebody who's competent, you know, you're, you can't just pay them $2 an hour. Somebody else will pay them more. They're going to bid up wages. I said, you know, most people earn a lot more than a minimum wage. I mean, I'm sure employers would like to pay all their workers minimum wage, but they can't because if they have skills that are in demand, other employers will outbid them. I mean, your workers are always looking for jobs. I mean, it's never been easier to find jobs than today when, as far as jobs being out there because you've got the Internet, you can search uh, for jobs, and every employee can go on a job interview during their lunch hour, uh, during a personal day. They're always looking for a better deal. And employers have to pay enough in money to their workers to retain them. Otherwise, their best workers are going to quit. And they're going to go someplace else. So I said, you know, even if there was no minimum wage, you wouldn't find a lot of people working for $2 an hour, right? But I did say that there would be some people who would work for $2 an hour, right? This is where, you know, apparently I really got myself into trouble. So we're going to talk about the examples that I gave as a result of her question where she asked me, Remember, she's coming up with this $2 number. She's saying, Peter,
paint me the picture of somebody who would work for $2 an hour, okay? I'm not suggesting that anybody work for $2 an hour, but she's asking me to paint her a picture of somebody who I think would. Paint me a picture of a person whose work would be worth $2 an hour. You know somebody who might be? Maybe somebody who is, uh, you know, what's the politically correct word, uh, you know, uh, for... Uh, you know, mentally retarded. What's uh, the new? The, okay. That's what I believe in the principles that the country was was founded on. But I'm not going to say that we're all created equal. You're worth what you're worth. You're worth what you're worth. Just like our founding fathers said. Okay, so there's so much wrong with that sentence, but that's the one that really got me in trouble. First of all, I'm in trouble because I lo I used the politically incorrect word to describe intellectually disabled people. That is the PC word that I, I, I was struggling to think of, right? I knew there was a word. I didn't want to offend anybody. So you can clearly see that I'm trying to figure out the word, but I can't. So I have to use the only word that I can remember, which was mentally, and then I followed that by using the R word. See, I'm not even gonna say it because I don't want to offend anybody who might be listening. So I don't want to use the R word. Right. But you would think, based on my hate mail, that I used the N word. Right. But I used the R word followed by mentally. I didn't just use it on its own or use the abbreviated form, which might be even more offensive. I, I kind of used a clinical term. The term that I used used to be the PC term because it replaced other terms that people believed were offensive. This was the PC term for a while until it was out of vogue and now there's a new PC term and I'm fine, you know, I, I know what that term is. But if somebody uses the wrong term, especially the way I did, right? I, I, I was trying to come out with the right term. I was trying to describe the situation for which I didn't know the new term. She could have told me the new term, right? Even after I used the politically incorrect term, she could have told me the correct term and then I could have rephrased that using the correct term. You know, Barry Ritholtz, who was my opponent or supposed opponent in this mock debate, according to what he wrote on his website, they gave him the opportunity to rehearse what he was going to say. He knew the questions in advance, and he said they took multiple takes. So they let him repeat his answers over and over until he got it just right. Because with Barry Ritholtz, who was in favor of the minimum wage, right, uh, they wanted to present his thoughts in, in, in the most articulate way possible. Me, it was like, ah, gotcha. You said that word, we're really going to use that, right? Even though I clearly did not mean to offend anybody. And I got all kinds of mail from people who maybe are parents of people who are, are intellectually disabled saying how hurtful it was and how offended they were because I used that word and how dare I use such an offensive, ugly word on, on television. And I had to remind them that I didn't use it on live television. It was in a taped four hour interview in which they use 70 seconds of the four hours. Who chose to use that word? It was only uttered once in four hours. The Daily Show chose to put that word on television knowing that it was offensive. So if anybody was offended by those words, don't blame me. I didn't choose to air them. If they would have asked me, I would have said, no, don't air that, right? They chose, out of all the words that I spoke, those are the ones they wanted on television because they knew people would be offended. See, so they don't care about offending people. I did, I was trying to come up with a politically correct term. They didn't care. If, as long as they can make me look bad, they don't care who they offend. So, you know, why don't you send, if you're sending your hate mail to me, send it to the, the Daily Show. But again, all the headlines that came out now, Peter Schiff says that the intellectually disabled should work for $2 an hour. Peter Schiff wants to repeal the minimum wage so that the intellectually disabled can be paid $2 an hour, although they didn't use the PC word. They all used the incorrect word because they wanted to highlight the fact that I said it. Again, you know, they don't care about who they offend. They just want to make me look bad. But here's the reality. That is the law. I explained that to uh, Samantha B. I said that intellectually disabled are already able to be exempt from the minimum wage. So there are plenty of intellectually disabled people right now who are working for $2 an hour. Some get a little bit more, some actually get less than $2 an hour, but they are working. So she said, give me an example. And that was one of the examples I gave her, intellectually disabled. But it was interesting because I also tried to explain that the government is therefore recognizing 
that the minimum wage law, if it applied to the intellectually disabled, which it does not, but if it did, that they couldn't get jobs, that the minimum wage was preventing them from getting work because of their limited skills. So they allow for an exemption. And I said, isn't that an admission that if the minimum wage would cause unemployment among the mentally disabled, there are some mentally abled people who are also going to be impacted by the minimum wage law, but they don't get an exemption. In order to get an exemption, you have to be intellectually disabled. But it was an acknowledgement that the minimum wage does, in fact, create unemployment. But I pointed out that it doesn't matter about the minimum wage for the intellectually disabled because they're already exempt. But of course, all the coverage is, is that I want to force employers who are now paying top dollar for the intellectually uh, disabled or minimum wage or more. I want to force them to just make them pay, get two dollars an hour because they're worth what they're worth. Now, that statement about you're worth what you're worth was not mentioned in, in the context of that discussion of the intellectually disabled. It was an entirely different part of the conversation in which I was explaining the minimum wage in general. And of course, I wasn't talking about what your worth is as a human being, but your value, your worth to your employer as measured by your productivity. But they left all that stuff out. They wanted to juxtapose me saying that the intellectually disabled should work for $2 an hour because you're worth what you're worth. And of course, they stuck in, I believe, in the principles that this country was founded on, which had nothing to do with that discussion about the intellectually disabled. They stuck it right in, in, in the middle to make it look like I said all these things continuously as part of one thought that I was expressing that, well, we're not all created equal. You're worth what you're worth. I did say we were not all created equal at some point when I was talking about ability. Yes, we're all created equal under the law. Of course, I believe that. But we don't all have the same talents, the same ambitions, the same intelligence, the same work ethic. And so, you know, people are going to achieve different levels of success. And it was kind of kind of a little bit off on a tangent of our overall conversation. But so they, they take those various pieces that are unrelated to the discussion of the intellectually disabled and they put it all together to try to paint me as some kind of out of touch uh bigot who wants to enslave the intellectually disabled, right, and force them out of their high paying jobs and force them into slave labor. Right. And I actually had a much bigger discussion about it uh, with respect to all the benefits that intellectually disabled people currently get from their jobs uh, that pay less than the minimum wage. And of course, I gave her other examples of people who would work for two dollars an hour, which they didn't use. But I'm going to get into those other examples on the other side of this break. So stick around. We will be right back. Played the sound where, you know, I use the politically incorrect term for the intellectually disabled. And of course, you know, the the um, Daily Show knew, but that by showing me using that term, right, that it would outrage and offend people. That was their, their goal, especially when they juxtaposed it with you're worth what you're worth, because they want to create the impression that I'm devaluing people based on those disabilities, that I think that somehow they're subhuman, that they're not worth what the rest of us are worth. I mean, that, you know, they, they, they crafted this sentence in such a way as to really outrage people and offend people because I'm devaluing other human beings. I'm putting a price on a human being, which I'm clearly not doing. The only time I talked about value and worth what you're worth was from the perspective of an employer in terms of your productivity and the impact that uh, your labor makes on their on their business. I explained to Samantha B, of course, that businesses are not charities and that the only reason we have jobs right, is because an employer is trying to make a profit. And when they hire somebody, they have to hire people that further their profitability, because if a business isn't profitable, it goes out of business. And then all the employees of that business will lose their job. So if an employer just starts hiring people, even if they have a negative impact on profitability, they may go out of business and everybody loses their job. So the employer is responsible. It's his duty to assess all of the contributions made by potential employees and to not hire anybody who subtracts from profitability. That's your goal. You got to stay profitable. You got to operate efficiently. You've got to satisfy your customers who demand low prices, because if you don't give them low prices, they're going to go to your competitor who will. That is how a free market economy works. So, again, you know, I explained all of this, but they just wanted to, you know, take words out of context and put them together uh, to create anger 
uh, among people who now see this CEO devaluing human beings and putting a price on people, which is something that I never did. The Daily Show did that in the editing room. I didn't say that during the interview. But here's the interesting thing. When Samantha B first asked me for an example of somebody who would work for $2 an hour, the intellectually disabled was not my first example. I actually off offered a different example that, of course, they didn't want to air, right? I said, how about the unpaid intern, right? Unpaid interns are currently working for zero, for free, right? So they're willing to work for nothing. So obviously, they would be willing to work for $2 an hour because that's more than nothing. $2 an hour would be a raise. I explained to Samantha that the reason they were working for nothing instead of $2 an hour, or maybe even more, is because of the minimum wage. See, the minimum wage makes it illegal to pay your intern $2 an hour, but it's okay to pay them nothing. So because of the minimum wage, people who might be able to earn $2 an hour or $3 an hour or $4 an hour are instead forced to work for nothing. Just like the unpaid intern who booked me on that show. The, the woman who arranged the interview had been an unpaid intern at The Daily Show. That's how she got started. I think she's no longer unpaid, but she started off being unpaid. Right? Clearly, she would have preferred to start off at $2 an hour. But that was illegal, you know, so she only got zero, right, instead of $2. Now, John Stewart's a rich guy. He could have paid her minimum wage. Why didn't he? You know, well, paid her because she was willing to work for free. So he hired her. But so I explained that situation. In fact, I said it was worse. I said that there are a lot of employers now because of lawsuits, right, where a lot of these interns that worked in the entertainment industry then sued their liberal employers because they didn't pay them anything, and they won. So I mentioned that now a lot of people who, you know, that, that I mentioned a lot of employers are afraid now because of the legal, you know, implications to have unpaid interns. So the only way they will bring about an unpaid intern is if they're getting course credit. So now what happens is somebody that wants an internship has to pay tuition at some college. Maybe they have to borrow the money to pay the tuition so that they can get an internship that they could have had for free. Or they might have been paid $2 an hour, but they can't because of the minimum wage. So I asked Samantha B, what's better? An intern getting paid $2 an hour or an intern getting paid $0 an hour? So that was an example where getting rid of the minimum wage would actually improve the situation and allow people who are working for nothing to get a raise. When I talked about the intellectually disabled, I mentioned that they were already working for less than the, the minimum wage. So she said, you know, that's another example of somebody who would work for two dollars an hour and i told her that i have first-hand experience because my wife's aunt has down syndrome and she has a job and she's not paid two dollars now i think it's 250 that she gets but whatever it gets she gets it's way below the minimum wage and i explained to samantha b um the reason that she has this job i mean it, it's not mainly for the money because people would and i have people Posting, how do you expect the intellectually disabled to support a family on uh, $2 an hour? Well, I don't expect the intellectually disabled to support families. I mean, they're intellectually disabled. My wife's aunt is still supported by her mother. She's 50 years old, and she never moved out of the house. She doesn't have a family. She is incapable of those things. I'm not sure what her intellectual capacity is. Is she like a six-year-old or an eight-year-old? I'm really not sure. She's a lovely woman. Uh, but, you know, she is intellectually disabled. She works not for the money. I mean, she enjoys cashing the check and the pride that it brings her. But it is for her self-esteem that she is working. It is for the enjoyment of the experience, the, 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 the quality that it brings to her life. She has a job she loves. She has friends co-workers that she enjoys being with. probably the best part of her day one of the reasons that she's probably lived as long as she has because initially her life expectancy was nowhere near 50 but i think that job and the personal sense of satisfaction that it brings to her is part of the reason that she's living as long as she has and i explained that if the minimum wage were to apply to her employer she would not have that job that lots of people with intellectual disabilities would not have jobs that they value if the minimum wage applied. 
So at least Congress had the good sense to allow for the exemption. I said, what do you want? Do you want to force employers to pay the intellectually disabled the minimum wage so that they end up not hiring them at all? Do you want to tell my aunt and people like her that they can't have the jobs that they love because we have to sacrifice those jobs on the altar of political correctness? You know, who is it that doesn't care about the intellectually disabled, right? The Daily Show that wants to throw them out of work or me who wants to enable them to work? You know, The Daily Show wasn't employing any of the intellectually disabled. Why don't they hire them? They care so much. Why don't they hire them and pay them the minimum wage? I mean, why should they? They wouldn't even pay their intellectually able-bodied people anything. They hired their, zero, their interns for zero. They didn't pay them the minimum wage. So here you have other employers that are going out of their way to create employment opportunities for the intellectually disabled, and they want to take that away. You know, they want to end uh, what they have uh, to look forward to. So th th this is the agenda of uh, the um, of the Daily Show. I mean, I also talked about our founding principles, about the principle of choice, right? The liberals like to talk about, oh, I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-choice. Well, what about two consulting adults choosing an employment relationship? I said, if I am an adult, or even a 16 or 17-year-old, and I want to work for $5 an hour, if that is my choice, why should the government deny me that choice? Why should the government say, no, you can't take that job? Either you find somebody who's going to pay you seven twenty-five an hour or you can't have a job. Where, where, where is the freedom of choice there? You know, why can't they be pro-choice? I wanted to talk about a society in which individuals can choose for themselves the jobs they want to take, the employment opportunities that they want to avail themselves of. Why does the government have to come in and superimpose their judgment and tell people, no, that job's not good enough for you. We'd rather you have no job at all than have a job where the pay is not what we think it should be. Well, why? You know, I, you know when, we, when we discussed uh, Walmart and I pointed out that the guy who's the incoming CEO got started minimum wage on a loading dock, you know, people think that the minimum wage job is a ceiling. That's the first step on the job ladder. But if you raise that step so high, a lot of people can't reach it. Right? That's why we have so much youth unemployment today that we didn't have before the minimum wage. I explained to Samantha B where the minimum wage came from. I said that when Roosevelt brought it up in 1938, it only applied to federal workers. It was Lyndon Johnson in the war on society, poverty that made it apply to everybody in the 1960s. But before that, you didn't have all this youth unemployment. You didn't have the teenage unemployment, especially in the African-American community. The unemployment rates there for young African-American kids is off the charts. It's 40 or 50 percent. It was a fraction of that before the minimum wage. In fact, before the minimum wage, unemployment for black kids was less than for white kids. That was the fact. The government screwed all this up with all these unintentioned laws. See, I was on The Daily Show to try to expose that. I thought, well, gee, I guess I can do a better job than anybody. If, if I don't volunteer to go on there, somebody else is going to do it, and maybe they wouldn't be as articulate as me. And I knew it was an important issue, and so I risked their trap. I guess I underestimated their ability to slice and dice what I said uh, to make me look like a complete pompous ass, uh, uncaring, insensitive, the exact caricature. This feeds into exactly what they want uh, their audience to think about the 1%, right? The, the CEOs, the rich people, right? This is feeding the class warfare that they are trying to generate. Hey, we got one more segment. If anybody, again, I can take some calls, 855-4SHIFT. If you saw this show and you, know, you want to comment on it, or if you didn't see the show and you want to comment on uh, my discussion, or if you happen to be on any of these pages, other people's websites. Check out my Facebook page. Look at all that, the hate that's expressed there and the ignorance, but more so on all these other websites throughout the blogosphere, all these left-wing websites. But even, look, even CBS News here in Connecticut ran a piece misquoting me, didn't bother to call me, get the truth, just accepted the comedy skit from uh, The Daily Show as if that's what I said. They didn't even want to call me and say, hey, did you say that? You know, what do you actually believe? What did you mean? No, no, no. They're just going to take The Daily Show's word for it. Continues right now. This is Peter Schiff here, and I actually misspoke uh, when I 
talked about the person who had booked me on The Daily Show who was in the room when uh, we were filming. Uh, I inadvertently said that it was a woman. It was actually a guy who had worked as an unpaid intern uh, prior to getting a paid gig at The Daily Show. You know, interestingly enough, it was a big room. There was lots of uh, you know opportunity for other people to be there. My brother came to the studio with me, but they refused to allow him in. They didn't want any witnesses uh, to what they were doing. Uh, obviously, we, we now know why. I mean, they w didn't want me to have my own recording. That's why we are calling for The Daily Show. I am demanding uh, that they release uh, all of the footage in its raw, unedited form. Of course, they are very reluctant to do it. I can't force them to do it, but I am asking that they do that, and you can help. You know, we have something up on my uh, Facebook page, up on Shift Radio, where a link is. You can sell, tell them, hey, you know, we appreciate the last, but we want to know the truth. I mean, uh, Peter Schiff is being discredited. Uh, so is uh, the principal he stands for because people believe he said things that he actually didn't say. So you were able to get the shock that you wanted from your audience, but I also think you owe it to your audience in America for them to actually hear what was said. So, you know, you can bring some pressure. Also, you know, try to encourage them to have me on in studio as an actual guest. You know, they had me on in 2009 as a guest. I was there. You can see it up on their website on The Daily Show. If you Google, you know, Peter Schiff Daily Show, you'll, you can see the clip. It was a good clip. I did it live. You know, they can't take anything out of context. They can't misrepresent you. If they ask a question, you get to see the actual answer to the question being asked. Uh, we had a lot of laughs. Uh, the audience actually applauded, too. So they liked me when they got to see the real me. They just didn't like me when they saw the me that was created, kind of the way Dr. Frankenstein created a monster by piecing together body parts from various corpses. That's kind of what they did uh, to my four-hour interview. They kind of pieced it together and created a monster. It was the monster they wanted everybody to see, uh, not the real person that sat in that room uh, and spoke, I believe, extremely eloquently and effectively uh, during those four hours.